everyone. My name, my name is Bruna Santos. I am the um, advocacy coordinator at um, Data Privacy Brazil Research Association, which is an NGO here from Brazil. And I'm also the chair of the non-commercial um, stakeholder group at ICANN. I am very, very happy to welcome everyone to this session today. And um, this is panel A3, Governing Standards and Infrastructure. Um, for this session, we expect each presentation to last no more than 10 minutes, and um, we will allocate um, another 8-10 minutes for our discussions. Um, this session will also be followed by a Q&A with the general audience. So for that, I would um, ask you all to please place your questions in the chat for presenters to consider during the Q&A session. And I'm also very happy to say that I'm joined today by our dear friend Farzani Badei, from Yale University who will be our discussant for this session. Um, with regards to the panel, we have a very interesting session for you today. Um, our papers explore the interaction between norms and internet standards and protocols and the internet governance bodies responsible for issuing them, such as the Internet Engineering Task Force, IETF, and the World Wide Web Consortium, um, W3C. Understanding or assessing how such norms are enforcing human rights principles, posing harms to general privacy provisions on the web, or even controlling or governing distributed um, infrastructures such as the internet are some of our approaches um, for this, um, this, this upcoming session. And um, I would like to introduce you to the general um, names of panelists and, and papers as well. So um, we'll start by a presentation with Julien Rossi. Um, his paper is named um, What Rules the Internet? A Study of the Troubled Relation Between Web Standards and Legal Instruments in the Field of Privacy. Um, following up, we'll have, um, we will have an, ex an exhibition by Ricardo Nani from the University of Bologna. And um, his paper is called Rising China and the Glo Global Internet, Assessing China's Challenge to Global Internet Governance System and International Liberal Order. Um, following up, we'll have, we welcome Corinne Kath from the University of Oxford, and her paper is called um, The Technology We Choose to Create, Human Rights Advocacy in the Internet Engineering Task Force. And last but not least, um, Neil Stanover will, from the University of Amsterdam will present his paper called um, Norm Conflict in the Governance of Complex, Transnational and Distributed Infrastructure, the Case of Internet Routing. Again, each panelist will have from eight to 10 minutes. I don't wanna take any more time from you guys. So I'll give the floor to Julien Rossi. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, can you hear me? I tend to have some problems with the microphone. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so thank you, um, Bruno Santos and uh, Frisane uh, Badi for chairing and uh, discussing this panel. Thank you to uh, all the organizers of this uh, online conference. So I'm going to share my screen and presentation. I hope you can all see it, uh, including if it is in full screen. So uh, I'm afraid you might not be able to see everything, but maybe like this is better. Anyway. So, um, I'm Julian Rossi. I'm uh, currently assistant professor at the uh, Catholic Western Catholic University in France, Université Catholique de l'Ouest, and I will be uh, pr um, presenting a paper that I wrote on the topic of the troubled relation between web standards and legal instruments in the field of web privacy. Um, this uh, was in large part inspired by work, a uh, field work that I conducted in the frame of my uh, PhD, uh, which was generally speaking on uh, data protection policy and different instruments, um, the production of different data protection instruments, uh, which had uh, included uh, field work on um, two uh, groups uh, working on privacy at the uh, um, W3C, World Wide Web Consortium, which sets the standards for the uh, for the web. Um, so uh, the paper uh, um, presents um, some reflections that arose when I was conducting this uh, fieldwork um, 
uh, and in particular this matter of the relationship between these different standards uh, I mean uh, sorry policy instruments um, so policy instruments can be defined as tools that allow governmental action to take shape and to become operational so uh, when we think of policy instruments we're going to think about laws contracts code uh, standards uh, design choices uh, but it can be also many other things uh, um, and um, sometimes uh, these instruments uh, are going to work together well but at other times there might be contradictions between uh, something that for instance for example is going to be set by law and then uh, uh, design choices um, in the classical realm of public policy uh, state-centered public policy uh, we would have some sort of clear hierarchy of norms um, um, which is a concept that comes from Hans Kelsen, uh, um, Austrian lawyer of the last century. And uh, his idea basically was to say that regulations, governmental regulations have to comply with laws and laws have to comply with international treaties and international treaties have to comply with constitutions. Now, this is a gross um, simplification because actually the uh, relationship between these different legal instruments is, isn't uh, always uh, that clear either, but um, um, in the realm of internet governance, uh, these things might become even more um, complicated when you look at standards, running code, design choices, and and uh, many many other things. Uh, now, the other um, element that uh, led me to uh, question. Uh, the relationship between these various norms in the field of internet governance and in general and um, web privacy in particular is that there is this general notion um, at least um, make, of course I mean notion that is disputed by uh, many of you who are in the audience or at least nuanced by many of you who are in the audience but there is this notion generally speaking that uh, cyberspace or internet might not be uh, regulated necessarily by states or maybe that the law uh, doesn't have any effect or it doesn't work or, or even shouldn't work on, on the internet on the web um, but uh, um, as we will see although this is reflected by some of the actors on the ground uh, there are some elements that uh, should lead us to, to question this even in the field of, of privacy so my case study was on uh, privacy, internet governance, and uh, specifically in the field of the web, uh, where we have many different kinds of, of uh, standards that exist, uh, I mean, of policy instruments that exist and that coexist and that are like um, the GDPR in the EU, you have some uh, standards, um, standardizing protocols you have some normative documents that are produced by standard setting bodies uh, that standardize the way that protocols should be uh, designed you have certifications labels you have of course running code and uh, implementations that are all of varying degrees of compliance um, now w3c started dealing with issues related to privacy uh, in 1997 when the uh, platform for privacy preferences was uh, began to be hosted by the w3c it existed before but it became a w3c project in 1997 uh, the project let, uh, ran an, until 2006 and uh, there were some uh, published uh, specifications but they were never really widely implemented around 2010 it was the launch of first a mailing list and then the uh, uh, official um, uh, chartering of the privacy interest group, um, which does basically um, uh, privacy um, ad um, advice to the other working groups of the W3C. In 2011, there was the launch of the uh, Do Not Track project uh, in the tracking protection working group at the W3C, uh, which meant to create an, an extension of the HTTP protocol that would allow uh, web users to express their preference not to be tracked. Uh, this also led to the publication of specifications, but and ultimately um, the charter of the, of the uh, uh, tracking protection working group was not extended past 2019. And more recently, there has been, uh, I mean, a, um, a privacy community group was launched uh, within the W3C to uh, incubate pr uh, various projects um, that are aimed uh, at protecting uh, privacy. 
Um, so um, in this field study, uh, I don't have a lot of time to, to describe in details um, uh, the, all of the methodology, but let's say that I uh, used two methods. I used um, all the materials that are available on uh, public mailing lists, uh, such as public tracking uh, for the tracking protection working group uh, or uh, public privacy for the privacy interest group. Um, but I also conducted uh, uh, qualitative interviews with uh, actors within these uh, groups and uh, it was striking to see that uh, when they talked about the topic uh, many um, of them uh, I mean the people of the people that I interviewed uh, expressed uh, the idea that laws were not necessarily relevant for their groups um, uh, even though you would expect them to say uh, otherwise because the interviews were conducted around the time when the GDPR came into force um, and, and, and was actually also being uh, discussed. And so many reasons, as you can see on the slide, uh, have been expressed uh, uh, to explain why standards, uh, I mean, laws, sorry, um, are not relevant for these um, uh, groups. Yet, despite the fact that they said that uh, laws are not uh, that uh, relevant um, or not that useful to uh, standard setting uh, bodies like the W3C, um, um, I noticed that in the debates that happen between members of um, especially the Tracking Protection Working Group, there were many legal arguments that were being used uh, to defend uh, positions of different actors um, and um, uh, that was uh, it, it, so it was interesting to see that these interventions were considered as legitimate whereas for example interventions on uh, values or political philosophy or why we should protect privacy to what extent what privacy means etc et are really uh, frowned upon by members of these groups uh, because there is this culture of consensus where there is this idea that you, you need to have consensus and not question the consensus, not threaten the consensus in order for any project to move on. But uh, legal arguments were seen as uh, some sort of, uh, in some way, neutral, uh, even though they were uh, used by certain actors in order to promote uh, a, cer uh, in a, in a certain agenda, including a pro-privacy agenda. Um, also underground, we could see that uh, there was some limited uh, impact of uh, legislative and regulatory pressure. These groups like the uh, P3P, Platform for Privacy Preferences uh, group, and then the Tracking Protection Working Group were set up partly uh, with the support of institutions like the Federal Trade Commission in the United uh, States or the European Commission. Um, and um, uh, may not have happened or may not have happened to the same extent uh, were it not for the support of these uh, institutions. Uh, and as you can see on this slide, the charter of the uh, Tracking Protection Working Group was uh, extended in 2017 and uh, re um, to re and refocused on compliance with uh, European Union legal instruments. And this coincides with the publication of the um, uh, e-privacy, uh, the project for the e-privacy regulation, um, which, however, uh, hasn't really um, 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 been able to make sure that uh, do not track uh, would be implemented today. Uh, and also um, the, the uh, demands uh, from the um, European Data Protection Authorities were not uh, all, and actually uh, most of the demands from the European Data Protection Authorities were not implemented uh, in the uh, uh, specification projects for uh, the do not track uh, stand, um, specification developed by the Tracking Protection Working Group at the W3C. Um, at, at the same time though, uh, uh, in terms of the, the general mindset of the discussions and, and the ideas that are, are referred to in the discussions at the WW3C, uh, there has also been a certain tendency for the word personal data, which comes from European law, to be employed more and more uh, and, and gain ground over personal information, which is more linked to uh, um, uh, US uh, legal uh, vocabulary. Um, and this has changed over the course of the uh, 
um, previous um, decade, uh, partly because of the involvement of certain actors and partly because of uh, this legislative pressure. So because I don't have that much time and because I, I want to uh, leave as much time as possible for the other presentations and uh, for the discussions at the end, I would like to try and conclude briefly uh, with some question marks actually, because um, this in this brief presentation, I had time to show that um, probably, I mean, definitely the um, Internet governance and web governance has not seceded from uh, governments, that the law remains uh, relevant despite uh, the way that it might be seen by a number of actors within the field on the ground. Um, uh, however, uh, um, uh, that, that these instruments are, are used as arguments um, and that legal arguments are not seen as threatening the technical consensus. However, uh, there is so far only limited efficacy of these laws. Only certain laws are influential, US and European laws. So it is not possible um, yet, or maybe it is not even desirable to conclude that there is any strict hierarchy between these uh, policy instruments. And lastly, but I don't have time to elaborate, there is of course a strategic element to the choice of policy instruments that you uh, choose to, to develop and to promote in, in different uh, fora. Um, so I hope I'm on time. Um, thank you for your attention and I will be looking forward to your um, questions. Thank you very much, um, Julian, and exactly on time. So 10, 10 seconds past the, the deadline, so it's all right. Um, I'll hand the floor now to Ricardo and Ricardo, please um, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for your introduction. Uh, I will share my screen. Can you see my slides? Okay, so I'm a PhD student uh, from, uh, from the uh, University of Bologna. My name is Riccardo Nanni, and I'll be presenting a paper based on my, um, on my research project, on, um, uh, on my PhD research project, which is on the role of Chinese actors in, uh, in global internet governance. Uh, in particular, I will place this research in the broader international relations debate on the decline of the liberal international order and the rise of China in as much as uh, the multi-stakeholder internet governance is, is a liberal informed one. So uh, the two aspects on which I will be mainly focusing is whether Chinese actors are increasing state influence in global internet governance and whether China contributing to fragmenting the internet. So, um, of course, global internet governance is a broad field, so we'll be focusing on two major uh, subsets, which are mobile internet standards from 3G to 5G, so mainly I will be studying uh, Chinese actors um, in uh, 3GPP, and critical internet resources, so I'm mainly observing ICANN and the ITF in this case. Well, these two subject, subsets, because but that's because of relevance for international relation theory. There's a political and economic one uh, as far as uh, intellectual property rights are concerned, but also a geopolitical one. We can see that 5G is a big issue in nowadays US-China tech competition. So to start my study, I focused on um, uh, quantitative data that are already available on uh, 3GPP and the ITF plus some ICANN documents, which we know are more scattered and less systematized than the previous two. Uh, based on this, I've elaborated four working suppositions, which are driving statements that will help me, that are helping me uh, in the qualitative uh, research. So we'll show you the supposition in the next slides, but I'd like to focus on um, the qualitative part of my methodology, which is based on uh, um, semi-structured expert interviews with Chinese and non-Chinese stakeholder um, members of six stakeholder communities, which are governments, international organizations, tech multinationals, civil society, academia, and the technical community. This is in red on the slides, and that's important because I'm trying to uh, feel a methodological and interpretivist up in the literature because 
most techn technopolitical analysis in, uh, in the field of politics is often done without taking into account the views and experiences of technologists. However, most of what goes on in 3GPP and the ITF is unintelligible to non-participants and particularly so to non-engineers. So uh, when we leave aside these particular views and experiences, we're missing an important part of how uh, global politics is deployed in a sense in everyday practices. So this is why uh, the focus. And from the theoretical point of view, I will be using uh, cognitivist regime theory, which accounts for the bidirectional relation between actors and the internet regime complex to interpret my findings. And in particular, the uh, concept of regime complexity is a very powerful one because it helps to explain specific behaviors by Chinese actors, well, not only Chinese, but I'm focusing on them. And such as, for example, the uh, forum shopping that takes place between uh, uh, ICANN and the ITU when Chinese actors leverage one against the other, for example. So these are the four working suppositions. So on a time reference from 1998, so the foundation of both 3GPP and ICANN up to nowadays, I'm supposing that Chinese elaborated standards on mobile internet technologies are competing with UN US ones, which means they are um, made to become universal, not to be local uh, specifications, incompatible with the global ones. I'm also supposing that governments and government controlled actors influence in global technical standardization processes has increased with the contribution of China and Chinese actors. Something similar um, is also supposed for critical internet resources governance, uh, especially in as much as uh, the effect of China's recession to the Governmental Advisory Committee of ICANN. And next, uh, that increased Chinese participation in the ITF has enhanced the likelihood of separate standards being created. Now, after having conducted 26 uh, interviews with few more to go, uh, what I found is the following. In terms of mobile internet standards, it appears that Chinese actors aim to shape the universal ones, so to create competing standards with UN US ones, not coexisting splinters. This is true on historical record because it hasn't always been the case. Um, when 3G was elaborated, um, China uh, adopted a national 3G standard. Uh, when it came to 4G, however, it adopted both the universal standard and a local specification, allowing one operator to use one standard or the other. But now when it comes to 5G, participants to 3GPP, both from China and from Western countries or Western multinationals, find no evidence of Chinese actors creating local uh, incompatible specifications, but rather they see Huawei being the main contributor in terms of um, standardization proposals to the establishment of universal 5G. However, when it comes to state influence, a less straightforward answer is found. What we see is state coordination rather than state control on companies. However, we know that China uh, is an authoritarian state. So how, this qualify, how does this qualify a coordination differently uh, than the kind of coordination that takes place from, um, for example, uh, Western liberal democratic governments uh, on their domestic companies. Now, of course, we can qualify this, but what's the threshold? Uh, what's the threshold between control and coordination when it comes to such a national systemic matter, in a sense? And something similar emerges in critical internet resources governance, where Chinese actors, have, including in the government, have become increasingly participatory in, uh, in ICANN, including the Governmental Advisory Committee. They acknowledge ICANN publicly. However, they're also seeking to strengthen uh, the national position in the, in the ITU, while also becoming more and more participatory in the ITF, and it is especially the case with Huawei. So uh, when Chinese actors, for example, propose such a thing as the new IP, uh, which was proposed by a ministry in conjunction with Huawei and all the state-owned and public, uh, uh, sorry, private actors, what do they do? Well, we have very few, uh, we don't have much technical information on the new IP, but what we can see is that something called IP has been presented in a state-based, majority-based uh, UN organization rather than uh, at the traditional um, IP home, which is the ITF, which is private-based, which is consensus-based. So we can see an emerging normative 
uh, challenge, uh, we can at least um, assume that in a sense. However, most of my participants find no evidence of China uh, trying to create, uh, uh, to enhance fragmentation uh, at the technical level, at least, at the logical layer. It's true. We don't know uh, what the consequences of the new AP might be because we don't have enough technical information. But at the same time, very few find an interest for China to establish uh, different technical protocols upon which the DNS would, should be allowed to work in one way or another, switching from one protocol to another. Um, now, especially now that if domestic companies are going global to use uh, the, Chinese, the Chinese government's own slogan. So if anything, we find other normative challenges, such as will the new AP uh, have an impact on privacy, given that uh, the Chinese government is so powerful in surveillance. And we probably find a split rather at the social and economic layer with uh, China uh, seeking to control uh, information fluxes domestically and also um, and also uh, allowing some platforms to be used while not on others, and a similar trend possibly taking place, although under dif a different ideological basis uh, in, in the West. But overall, when it comes to international relations theory, the old view that the liberal order allows emerging powers to become global powers within the existing order itself appears to, to hold because Chinese actors, both public and private ones, have become increasingly powerful in the existing internet governance regime complex in the existing forums, uh, not, not through the creation of new ones. So this is all from my side, but before concluding, um, I'd like to expose some limits and caveats of my research, including one I've already mentioned, which is the difficulty in interpreting the contents of technical documents from 3GPP and the ITF. The conceptual overlaps that there can be in the classification of stakeholders, given that that there isn't a universal one that yields no conceptual overlapping among the groups. And then we have methods of positionality, which are essential to be acknowledged in qualitative research and the problem of digital orientalism. I myself am a liberal oriented white European researcher. So when addressing actors from such a different cultural and political context like China, of course, the, um, there are positionality issues. And next, of course, is the difficulty I find in conceptualizing public-private relations among Chinese actors, which is, again, uh, an open question in the field. Uh, so this is all from my side. I hope I respected the time limits. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ricardo. This was definitely um, an interesting paper as each and every single one of them. And, um, a good exploration on this governmental participation in multi-stakeholder and technical forums. Um, thank you very much for your um, presentation again. Um, now we're gonna have um, Corin Kath. Um, Corin, please, um, the floor is yours. Yeah, let me just see if my screen share is working. Can you see my presentation properly? Yes. Perfect. Um, so hi, um, my name is Corinne. I'll be um, talking about some of the research that I've done, I'm doing for my PhD. Um, specifically, let me just make this a little bit smaller. This article is an uh, ethnographic analysis of recent effort within the Internet Engineering Task Force, um, specifically to consider human rights values in the development of internet networking. Um, it's an adaptation of one of my PhD chapters and forms part of uh, ongoing doctoral research. As such, I'm very excited to be uh, sharing it with you today and very much welcome your, your thoughts and feedback on this ongoing work. Um, a little bit of background. My name is Karen Kant. I'm a PhD candidate at the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, I'm a digital anthropologist studying internet governance cultures. And this particular paper was very uh, generously supported by the Ford Foundation and the Alan Turing Institute for Data Science and AI. So what will I be talking about today, tonight, uh, where I'm at in Turkey right now? Uh, I'll be giving an introduction to my case study. Uh, I'll go over some of my methods and data. I'll locate my contribution in internet governance literatures, move to my findings and, uh, and discussion. 
So um, in this paper, what I try to do is provide a detailed anthropological picture of how ITF participants understand technology and what consequences their perspective have for human rights advocacy efforts within internet governance, specifically within the Internet Engineering Task Force. And what I identify is that there is what I call a culture um, of protocol non-prescriptiveness, which is a particular view on technology and on human rights, which becomes apparent in how IETF participants talk about standardization. And so what I do is I identify this non-prescriptive view of technology as a barrier to addressing human rights values through standardization. And what my findings try to do is inform ongoing academic as well as policy debates uh, about the role of human rights advocates within technical spaces like the ITF. And what I also try to do is um, add uh, to the ongoing debates about the recent turn to the infrastructure in internet governance research. Um, so a little bit of an introduction to uh, the case study. Um, so in October, hey, Corinne, that, yeah, sorry, you're uh, sharing your notes. I did this in the first talk too, and ah. no one told me. So I thought we can't really see the slides. Oh no. How do I, let me see if I can fix that. I just sent you a message on, on the chat as well. Corinne. Yeah. Which I obviously can't, can't see. Let me see if I can fix this. Is this better? Yes. yes. Now it works. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let me just move on. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, so that puts me to the question of uh, who, who sets the standards? So in October 2014, there were two human rights um, activists who uh, presented a bold idea to the IETF. Um, they wanted to develop research on how internet standards and protocols might impact human rights values. And on the basis of that research, they wanted to develop guidelines that the IETF engineers could use to mitigate any potential negative impacts of their work on human rights. And to do that, they set up a specific um, research group within the Internet Research Task Force, which is the IETF's research subsidiary. In October 2017, so about three years later, um, they published uh, an RFC that had these specific human rights guidelines within them. However, we're now in 2020, um, so three years later again, uh, after publishing them, these guidelines have seen very limited uptake in the IETF, nor are the claims of the human rights activists about the relationship between human rights and protocols um, very well integrated into the IETF's cultural understanding of technology. Now, this obviously raises a number of questions, starting with what actually happens when human rights advocates join the IETF? Um, how do their values and goals conflict with those of IETF engineers? Um, where and where is the rough consensus found in discussions about the role of human rights values in standardization? And so to address these specific questions, um, this particular article analyzes the recent human rights advocacy efforts between 2014 and 2017. So the beginning of the work. Um, a little bit about my data and methods. Um, so my overarching doctoral project on which this particular article is based investigates how human rights um, advocates shape internet standardization at the IETF through a multi-event ethnographic study. Um, so between 2016 and 2020, I engaged in online and offline participant observation at the IETF, um, including uh, their meetings, both online and offline, and the mailing lists. Um, I also conducted 65 semi-structured elite interviews, which lasted between 60 and 90 minutes. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this in the, in the little time that I have left. So if anyone has any questions about the details of my methods and methodology, I'm happy to discuss that in Q&A. In terms of the literature, um, in my overall PhD, I tried to draw together internet governance research on human rights and the infrastructural turn with uh, literature from digital anthropology, which specifically is focused on engineering uh, and open technology cultures. And in this specific paper, I focus on ongoing debates about the role and efficacy of human rights advocates in the ITF, as well as on the epistemology of the infrastructural turn. And what I try to do is um, apply my findings to argue that the efficacy of human rights advocacy efforts 
should really be understood through the cultural assumptions and engineering views that actually drive these efforts within the IETF on the one hand. And then what I also try to do is apply anthropological data to the turn to the infrastructure to help further ground the definition of infrastructural co-optation. So that brings me to the findings and, disc uh, and discussion. Um, so how do IETF participants understand technology? When I spoke to the different engineers, um, four particular themes kept on coming up. So connectivity, permissionless innovation, interoperability, and openness. Now, these four might seem really obvious, um, but the devil is really in the detail of what the engineers meant when they use these particular terms and whose norms, knowledge, and worldviews actually shape their definition. So when I looked a little bit deeper, I saw that when they talked about connectivity, they talked about connectivity as between machines and not between humans. Um, they talked about permissionless innovation as the absence of centralized authority. They talked about interoperability as voluntary cooperation. And they talked about openness as freedom from coercion. And what you see is that taking, uh, taking these together, these really show a culturally situated understanding of technology um, that paints a picture of protocols as voluntary and opt-in and as non-prescriptive. And it also indicates that they have always served technical and social purposes at the same time, which are really hard to disentangle from each other. Now, in the case of the human rights advocacy, um, these particularly culturally situated understandings of technology created a lot of friction. Um, and I tried to describe in this paper the resulting friction in terms of the IETF's culture of protocol non-prescriptiveness. Um, and what I show is that their articulation of these, of these technological functions uh, of the internet's infrastructure are very much rooted in liberal notions of individual freedom, uh, of voluntarist uh, connection and of choice. Um, that is, they, are under they understood standards through protocol non-prescriptiveness and that actually increased the tensions between the human rights advocates on the one hand uh, and the more traditional IETF engineers on the other hand. Because the latter, the, engineer, the IETF engineers, saw the human rights efforts really um, as containing certain aims and goals um, that impose requirements on standardization that contravened their culturally uh, situated set of beliefs about what they were doing and about the nature of standards. Um, and this friction was played a large part in the, um, in the difficulties that the human rights advocates had in getting their work and their notion of human rights values to take currency within the IETF. Um, so what? Why does any of this matter? I mean, that's really the question why all of us are here today. Um, I think it matters because it shows a number of both theoretical and, and practical insights. So in terms of theory, um, it shows that the efficacy of human rights advocates is not merely predicated on how the relationship between human rights and technology is framed which is what certain um, academics have argued in, in previous articles. Um, but it also shows that it is really fundamentally shaped by IETF culture. What it also shows is that there's a really close connection between code and culture, um, which raises very clear epistemic questions for the turn to the infrastructure. And specifically for how we can know when something constitutes an original technical or policy function. Um, as I would be more inclined to say that these two always exist together, but, they, that, but that they sort of come up in different dimensions or that different dimensions of the infrastructure are more important in certain contexts than in others. And this is also where I locate the contribution of ethnographic work and really bringing a, an on the ground perspective on what it means to be doing internet governance. Um, and so the last thing I sort of wanna leave you with is that building on my findings, especially around the epistemic limitations of the current turn to the infrastructure, i.e. how do you disentangle what is technical and what is policy? So you can argue that there is currently a more political use of the infrastructure, so to speak. Um, I also wanna end by arguing that human rights advocacy or other public interest interventions within internet governance are not necessarily outside of technical uh, or policy functions. They can also be sort of a novel iteration of what uh, is an established ITF practice, 
namely structurally including social and political questions in standard development, as both Professor Donardis and Professor Brahman have shown in their excellent work. Only this time, it includes questions related to human rights values. Um, my article does not in any kind of way try to discount the importance of the turn to the infrastructure or any of the insights that come with it. Um, what I really try to do is show how anthropological inquiry really presents a viable avenue um, for further refining these really important insights into how uh, code, culture, and choice come together to constitute internet governance. Um, thank you so much for bearing with me as I figure out Zoom and PowerPoint and code and culture. Thank you very much, Karin. And also thank you for leaving your notes up at the very beginning. As a lot of us pointed out in the chat, they were very useful ones. So such as our article with a, a very interesting breakdown of the IETF um, <laughs> community and also um, civil society advocates in the human rights discussion there. Um, so I'm gonna ask um, everyone to please um, pose your questions on the chat. Um, if you wanna direct any question to any of our panelists, um, feel free to do so. And now I'm gonna hand the floor to Neil Sinover or Dr. Neil Sinover, I, as I was also corrected on the chat. Um, Neil, you have the floor. Niels, I'm not sure we hear you um, so far, but. I mute my audio, finally. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> that was one thing I wasn't able to test today. So, but now <laughs> I guess I did. So uh, here we go. So thanks so much, everyone. It is a, it's a tough follow after these great presentations, but I will give it a try. And I hope you don't see my notes because they won't uh, stand in the shadow of Corinne's. So I'm Neil Sanuver. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Amsterdam and Texas A&M University. And I uh, study uh, internet governance in part as a governance innovation. Uh, I was once in a lecture by uh, Jan Aertsholte, who said that if the UN would be reinvented today, it would look like internet governance. So what does that mean? And how can we build a public space on privately owned and governed infrastructure? So uh, in my research, I tried to understand how invisible infrastructures provide a social technical ordering to information societies and how this influences the distribution of wealth, power and possibilities and how these infrastructure can subsequently be aligned with societal values, the public interest and human rights. So in this case, I do that in internet routing in the paper, Norm Conflict in the Governance of the Transnational and Distributed Infrastructures, the case of internet routing. And the research question is, how are power and control exerted in the governance of distributed infrastructure, such as the internet? And I do that because infrastructure sets the invisible rules that govern the space of everyday lives. And many of these rules are not done in, the, in law or diplomacy, but in the language of infrastructure, as Keller Eastling notes. And of course, not just because the internet is important and infrastructure is important, but internet governance is also seen as a governance innovation. And I look at the uh, logical layer. In earlier parts of my work that came together in my PhD uh, uh, book, Wired Norms, I looked at uh, ICANN, the, the IETF, but here I focus on internet routing and specifically regional internet registries. So routing, I think, is also increasingly important with increasing, increasing geopolitical demands by nation states to, uh, uh, to limit routing. And to frame this and understand this, I use the concept of infrastructural power uh, by Thomas Mann, which was initially understood by a means of control by a state over a territory. But Mann mentions that if the state loses control of its resources, they diffuse into civil society, decentering and deterritorializing it. And applying this framework to the, uh, uh, to the internet seems interesting because the internet also was initially uh, uh, invented as a response to the launch of Sputnik and was heavily funding from the, uh, uh, from the US government, uh, government. 
that then also disseminated influence as indicated by scholars like Madeleine Carr in the mid 2000s. But now it is emanating so far that control might work differently now into other partners. So how is control and power exerted? For the second concept I use, I use uh, 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 instead of actor network theory or social technical imaginaries, I use norms to understand that. I do this because I do not only want to trace or describe power, but I want to contribute to the theorization about how power works in the governance of distributed infrastructures. And for that, I use the, uh, 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 the concepts by Erskine and Carr for norms, namely widely accepted and internalized principles or codes of conduct that indicate what is deemed to be permitted or prohibited by a particular community. So if we look at the, uh, how internet routing works, then there the internet, of course, is a network of networks, and these networks are autonomous systems, and there are roughly 70,000 of them, depends on how you count. All these autonomous systems uh, have a number called, nicely, autonomous system numbers. And these are assigned by regional internet registries. An autonomous system, num an aut having an autonom autonomous system allows you to get assigned a block of, uh, uh, of IP addresses that are registered in the routing database. And then subsequently, the routing uh, uh, between these networks goes through the border gateway protocol. And which network has control over which IP addresses and how these IP addresses, uh, how packet uh, traffic then should be routed, goes through traffic announcements in a, uh, uh, that network gossip to each other, but also which network, which can make a statement about which IP addresses is also held in uh, uh, an internet, in a registry that is maintained by the regional internet registry. And through these unique IP addresses and unique autonomous system numbers, traffic can find its way over the internet because it understands if it wants to reach a particular uh, IP address, it needs to look for a particular network and find a way there. And that finding a way there is quite interesting. So I try to understand how all these different interests of these different networks uh, uh, fit together. But also the technical community speaks about, uh, uh, about values. Here's a classical paper by uh, David Clark et al. Yes, that's the person who coined the ITF's unofficial motto, we reject kings and presidents. We believe in rough consensus and running code. Because it already mentioned that value should be an inherent part of routing. And Sandra Brahman, who Corinne mentioned before, also showed in her work that values have been discussed since the early internet in, in the first RFCs, but many of these were just not prioritized in implementation. In his excellent, excellent work, uh, and I really love this PhD dissertation, which I think everyone should read, Ashwin Matthew shows that currently routing decisions are made based on a mixture of efficiency, the shortest path, trust between network operators, and economics. So to try to bring out values and see which ones could be inscribed and which ones not, I developed an experiment. So using an ethnographic probe for participants in the policy making for, uh, uh, for internet routing, I uh, used this epistemic community of network operators to reflect on existing habits or practices combined with the quantitative and qualitative mailing list analysis and document analysis, one, years of one year of participant observation and 19 quasi-structured interviews. So I did this in the regional internet registry for Europe, uh, the Middle East and uh, uh, Western Asia called the Riso IP European or called RIPE. So to launch this probe, I needed to be able to express a value in routing, but I was not going to invent a new norm. So I look, looked for an existing one that I could translate to the technical environment. So, and what do you think I could come up with? Of course, the GDPR that you are all very uh, intimately familiar with. Also, because on many of the networks, this would be already applicable. I also used uh, as a second uh, uh, as a second uh, probe the UN guiding principles for business and human rights, which makes it possible for uh, businesses to show that they respect human rights. And many of these uh, 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 network operators 
are either subject to the GDPR and some have also signed up to the UNDPs. So I thought it would not be too big of a hurdle for them to actually show that they, uh, uh, that they can express this in routing. So I developed these two AS sets that I uh, introduced into the uh, routing registry. So autonomous systems could sign up to these, uh, 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 to these AS sets, and then people could preferentially route over privacy respecting or human rights respecting networks. Unfortunately, this got directly rejected. The question now, of course, is why? And that is because what I call the infrastructural norm of interconnection. It says that it is expected of network operators to produce interconnection in a voluntary bottom-up way facilitated by collaboration and trust, and that the network facilitates and engages in interconnections with the BGP protocol, RIPE coordinates and facilitates interconnection through the RIPE database, and everyone has control over their own networks. And interconnection is based on incentive structures and enlightened self-interest. So when trying to then bring up these norms, different sources for resistance were found. I mean, technological materiality, well, the routers do not allow to express such values, the institutional configuration, the, the RIPE database is not mentioned for that, and RIPE is not the routing police, culture and identity. Well, this is not how it's done and more interconnection is functioning for the good of the internet and what you are proposing might actually create less interconnection so that's bad for the internet and economic incentives so there is no incentive to adapt measures that could limit interconnection so the interconnection norm brings together many of these different incentives that allows these epistemic communities with different and distinct interests to cooperate and evaluate uh, candidate norms so everything that complicates or hampers in uh, interconnection gets resisted, such as we saw here, the GDPR and the UNGPs, but we've also seen similar things around Schengen routing, but also around certain security measures. So the increasing permeation of the internet in society inevitably leads to conflicts between different norm regimes. It is therefore important to understand how transnational routing governance approaches norm conflict. The interpretive lens of infrastructural norms allows for the application of the concept of infrastructural power beyond territoriality while taking institutional configuration, technological materiality, economic incentives, and identity into account. So this interconnection norm is a deeply embedded and overarching norm that evaluates candidate norms based on their ability to increase interconnection. And this could help explain why many ethical and legal norms are rejected in the governance of the internet infrastructure. When mobilized, the concept of, of infrastructural norms can foreground norm conflicts in the process of internet governance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Niels. Um, now it was me who muted myself and I muted in confusion with the microphone. But thank you for your relevant and updated assessment on policymaking norms for internet routing and, and so on. So, and now I'm gonna hand the floor to Farzani Bade, um, our discussion for um, this afternoon. Um, Farzi, you have the floor. All right, thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, these very interesting uh, papers. I am very excited that we have scholars like you that uh, look at the field of internet infrastructure that is unfortunately understudied compared to other topics on internet governance. Um, one thing that I want to suggest as a whole uh, is to look at, when we are looking at infrastructure to look beyond stand single standard policy making bodies or like um, a group of them and look at the institutional landscape that you are actually studying um, in, with the context of your choice so it could be privacy in its certain um, in its certain institutional landscape and not necessarily looking at these individual uh, institution uh, organizations because then um, or if we are looking at them it would be great to uh, make a connection because decisions are um, made uh, throughout internet governance and are made at different levels. 
So if we do this uh, single approach of looking at these organizations on, on their own, we might be missing the bigger picture. Um, now, I, uh, for uh, Julian's uh, paper, I, I really enjoyed it. It was very interesting, um, especially uh, because uh, you actually look at these understudied uh, working groups about privacy in uh, web standards and the one thing that i am um, and you don't mention this in, uh, you didn't mention it in your presentation but you mentioned it in your paper one uh, one thing that you um emphasize uh is uh the theory of cody's law uh by uh, lessig and uh and um you know you have a, a discussion about that uh which i i'd like to make the point that well, maybe, um, I don't know if you had this intention to actually apply the theory of Cody's law or see if it's if it's actually applicable to this uh, field, but Cody's law in its absolute sense means that code works like a legislative body and becomes as binding and as powerful as the law is. So the coders regulate us with those codes and the law is um, not there. So, but in general, the approach you have taken provides a very interesting insight. It says that standard setting organizations might pay attention to these laws, actually. But when you bring this theory of uh, Cody's law, I, I get a little bit confused whether what you are trying to do with it. And also looking at other uh, theories of um, you know, the, uh, because Cody's law, of course, as you mentioned, also is a contested uh, theory and it might not be, um, you might want to use other theories as well. And um, also uh, another point is that the general notion that you're talking about, uh, like, you know, the kings and uh, there are no kings and all, all these things. And, and I hear it from the other uh, scholars uh, presentation. I don't think this libertarian kind of claim uh, really uh, holds water anymore, even among themselves. And um, we have kind of moved on. Uh, I, as much as I love Barlow and I even have his picture on my wall, uh, he was not an academic. And uh, he, uh, he um, it's better to base your arguments on scholars that actually made these arguments like, you know, Trader Hardy and in 1994 even. Um, so uh, that was, uh, okay. So now uh, let's go to um, the Ricardo's paper. Okay, so Ricardo, this this is a very very interesting um, uh, paper because for the like the simple fact that it doesn't um, uh, it doesn't presuppose that China is trying to split the internet and trying to actually um, kill the uh, world order uh, on on the internet and it is asking the uh, question of whether uh, China is actually doing this. And um, another interesting point about the paper is looking at 3GPP, which is a very interesting uh, organization. It is definitely an internet uh, uh, infrastructure. However, uh, we uh, have understudied it, or at least I haven't uh, read a lot about it um, in other uh, contexts. Um, so uh, the role of governments are a little bit uh, overblown. Uh, uh, you don't really have to convince us more than a couple of sentences that non-state actors matter in internet governance. Actually, they are an integral part of it. So um, also, I kind of turned a blind eye on calling ICANN an international organization. Um, because the rest of your analysis uh, were not affected by categorization, but uh, be very careful when you actually present it somewhere else. Um, uh, and then when we come to, and also like considering intergovernmental organizations as their standalone organization and not in the group of governmental organization can uh, cause problems because at ICANN, it is, uh, through the government stakeholder group that these intergovernmental organizations actually uh, have an effect and uh, influence policy. Um, 
and some tiny mistakes on, uh, you know, how the IG's institutions work, uh, but uh, of course they're not uh, very um, major. For example, you mentioned that IP management is done by ICANN, but um, it's uh, it, strictly speaking, it's done by regional internet uh, registries. Uh, but overall, a very interesting paper, and uh, especially in this uh, glim uh, time that we are um, talking about China as like the evil that is going to take over everything. So um, now uh, I will go to Corinne's paper, which um, so Corinne is one of my uh, favorite uh, writers in this field. So I, I'm really grateful that I got to read her article again. And I think that, uh, uh, Corinne, you're bringing a whole new perspective to internet governance studies, uh, or at least contributing to this very new uh, field. Um, and that is bringing anthropology and applying it to the reflexive internet governance stage. And I think that is very va uh, valuable. Um, one thing that I see in both your uh, paper and Neil's paper uh, is that the um, that you want to uh, you want to study these organizations and kind of expand their mandate um, and uh, in order to consider human rights. Now, this is on itself a, is a, is a good goal. It's good for a human being, but. But then it might not be possible, and I really loved it that you called uh, me uh, baddie in the paper. But as I said, uh, as I have actually argued, um, uh, uh, oh, I have only three minutes. Okay, so uh, okay, so as as I have argued, I have given uh, Niels a lot of comments. So yeah. <laughs> It's okay. So uh, as, I as I have ar argued before, uh, we might want to look at the institutional landscape. So not only at ITF, because you might actually notice that the culture of this individual, the norm that uh, he or she is abiding by is different when they are at ITF and the, when the setting changes and they go to ICANN, they might have a different, uh, uh, they might abide by a different norm. They might have a, a different culture. And, and I give you an example that, for example, when we talk about who is at IETF, when we talk about, uh, uh, when we talk about how to come up the pro uh, with, with the protocol, the engineers have an uh, idea about, have, a, have an idea about it, how technically it works and stuff like that. And, and the goal is to actually get the data. But when you come to ICANN, then you can see that you have the uh, you know the uh, the attitude uh, changes based on the stakeholder group they belong to. So I think that uh, it would be great if you uh, look at beyond and in both Niels and um, and uh, well to a lesser extent to uh, in uh, Corinne's paper we see that um, you can consider interconnectedness as a norm and uh, I'm really not convinced. I, uh, and um, well, if you can convince me with more calls and quantitative studies, but interconnectedness, because it is the goal and the mission of these organizations, these ISPs, these actors, if it's the, their goal, then norms are those things that they do to achieve that goal. So I really don't, I really don't buy that interconnectedness is the actual norm. And uh, that was about it. Uh, Chair, do I have one more minute? Um, I'm actually please, done please here. Oh ahead. yeah, no, just one more thing about Neil's uh, paper. So Neil's internet routing, as you know, is uh, about um, internet routing isn't, uh, RIPE is not the only actor in it. There is like multiple actors, multiple organizations that work together and RIPE is like a small, really small uh, actor that has a small mandate. And then what your, uh, what your, and in internet routing, governance is totally like, it's a whole new world. It's not just RIPE. And then the other, uh, the other thing is that when you only consider the, in, uh, when you only consider internet routing when it comes to RIPE, then what sort of privacy are you trying to bring as a norm? Internet routing, the BGP, 
doesn't have personally identifiable information when AES is an exchange. So I suggest that look at the broader picture. So that was about it. Thank you. Sorry, I went on. I don't know. Thank you very much, Farzani, for your remarks on every single paper of this panel. Um, we're going to go to the Q&A session right now. I have roughly around nine minutes for the session to end, but I'm going to read um, some of the questions posed in our chat. Um, the first one was for Julian. Um, the question was, how does your work engage with the research and findings of Nick Doughty? Um, furthermore, are legal norms also implemented through web standards? A second question is um, for Corinne. Um, I was wondering if you also looked at how lobbyists um, influence the way the IETF technologies make proposed or edits proposals. And a second question for Corinne is um, how to inject more social considerations into this individualistic um, culture. And last but not least, uh, Niels, um, the question is, can you talk about the cultural origins of these norms? Um, I ask because I'm curious about the analysis of broader cultural bases upon which these norms might have potential to change. Um, each of the panelists, um, I would ask you to please um, answer these questions in a couple of minutes. Um, Ricardo, also feel free to um, reply to any comments um, our discussant has proposed on your paper. And um, Julian, we can start with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for all these questions. Uh, I will try to be brief, which is not going to be easy, but um, uh, I will try and make it. Um, so, um, the first uh, comment um, regarding uh, looking at the wider institutional landscape is something to I definitely agree with. Uh, it's just difficult sometimes to do in practice, but I agree definitely with the, uh, with the aim, the objective. Uh, regarding the question on code is low, um, I actually, my theoretical framework, I, I um, prefer using the uh, Lex Informatica theory of Joel Reidenberg, which I find a little bit more complete because it does not includes not only code itself, but also standards and protocols and so on. Um, and um, um, it is true, uh, I would agree that code works as a legis as something that is close to a legal act. For example, if you think about in a national context, your tax returns, they are going to be really calculated by software used by the tax agency, uh, not by the law. Uh, however, in a national context, uh, everyone would agree that the software that is going to calculate your tax returns has to abide by the law. And uh, I was curious about, you know, how, how this translates into an international context into the context of uh, internet governance. And this is where I think things become more complicated uh, in this relationship. Um, and uh, uh, regarding John Perry Bartlow, uh, he's indeed not an academic, but I would argue at least in the field where I was, uh, that I was studying and, and on the ground that his ideas uh, st still, still have an influence and still shape the way in which uh, actors are also socialized to take part in work, uh, standard setting work at uh, W3C and, um, and likely also the IETF um, and such. Uh, finally, to answer the questions by Niels Tanufa, how do I engage with work by Nick Doty? I, I like his work a lot. Uh, I also quote him a lot in my research, especially the work he did with Deirdre Milligan on techno policy uh, standard setting, but I don't have that much time to talk, elaborate on that. Maybe we can do that uh, later in this chat or in the uh, business part later. Um, finally, are legal norms also implemented through web standards? Yes and no. There are attempts, uh, but they're um, incomplete, uh, imperfect. Uh, even in the do not track does not fully allow for correct implementation of uh, GDPR, probably. Um, um, but um, there, it, it does tend to drive the emergence of, of new standards, including, uh, by the way, standards that are uh, built uh, by single actors and by the industry, like the Transparency and Control Framework of the in uh, Interactive Advertisement Bureau uh, that you see um, uh, implemented in many cookie banners, but that is not really compliant. It's done to comply with the law, but is not really compliant either. Uh, yeah. I, stop here uh hope i didn't take too much time and that i was able to give some clear answers uh, despite not having enough time thank you thank you very much julian um Ricardo? Hi, um yeah thank you uh for your for your comments and um, yeah uh, actually 
um, in particular for the reminder not to stress too much uh, the fact that non-state actors matter because that's something I really I really struggle with because I know that within the uh, internet governance uh, scholarly or policy practitioner community I don't have to stress that but I may have to in the um, out uh, so to say international relations world where the state-centric view of international of international relation is still very powerful so yeah I need to strike a balance between the need to um, stress this aspect to a specific to uh, one audience and not stress it to another which instead um, is more aware of uh, non-state actors role in that and thank you also for the other comments uh, upon which uh, will be I will be working uh, as I go on with my research. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Corin. Yep. Yeah. Hey, um, I'm not 100 percent sure how to answer the question about the lobbyists because I would need a little bit more information about what this particular person means by lobbyists because that could be a lot of things in the IITF. Um, so I'm going to skip to the question about how to include sort of more pro-social values within the IITF, given its culture. Um, so I think there already are a lot of very pro-social values in the IITF. And this also speaks to the question that Farzane asks about expanding the mandate of the IITF. Um, I think to a large extent, it is a lot bigger than we tend to think about. And this is also what the work of Sandra Brahman shows, is that social and political discussions have been part of the IETF's history since its inception. Um, and that's also where sort of my work on um, the limits of the infrastructural turn come from, because I simply don't think that you can epistemically disentangle social um, from technical functions, right? If anything, it's one and the same thing, but occasionally you see one side being amplified more or in a different context than the other. Um, I think the interesting thing about the IETF, and this is something that I talk about in uh, some of my other chapters, is that it does tend to skew towards particular social values. So for instance, privacy from government interference is a really important one in the IETF. And you can see that throughout its history, most recently in its response, its institutional response to the Snowden revelations. So the problem is not so much how do you, um, at least from the perspective of a human rights advocate, the problem is not so much how do you interject social values at all, because there is a long history of doing that. The question is, how do you interject values that are not natural to the community, that are not natural to the organization? Um, and I'm not sure I have a singular answer to that question, but I do know others who have done uh, scholarship on that work. So. As I was listening to the answers of the other um, panelists, I quickly grabbed this book by uh, Christina Dunbar Hester, which is about hacking diversity. And she has this really nice quote that I like, which is, um, this underscores why wicked and scary social problems cannot be solved by adopting the workplace logics with which they overlap. Now, she speaks specifically about doing diversity advocacy within open tech cultures. But I think that same sort of um, dynamic applies to the IETF, that if you want to start introducing new values that are not sort of native to the community, you need to move beyond trying to sort of embed those questions within the existing culture of the IETF, because then they will simply get assumed to match the already existing rhetoric there. Thank you very much, Corinne. Um, last but not least, Niels. Thanks so much for the for the for the great conversation, and I'm always happy to like add footnotes to uh, to Corinne's work. The, um, uh, Ashwin asked if I could like locate the um, the origins of the infrastructural norm, and I was actually very surprised to find the infrastructural norm because when in a previous chapter of my PhD I interviewed uh, uh, and did a quantitative analysis of the mailing lists in the IETF. I found that the social technical Im 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 imaginary of the internet architecture was soundly rooted in end-to-end -end openness and, permi and permissionless innovation. But in the most social political consideration of the uh, translation of that, that actually got undermined. So I actually think that the, uh, um, the infrastructural norm of interconnection 
is more a lowest common denominator that allows so many groups with distinct interests to collaborate. So I think it, uh, 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 it emerged while many other ideas uh, 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 faded away, especially during the, pro during the period of privatization and commercialization and consolidation, of course. So I hope that uh, answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, every, thank you thanks to everyone for hanging around. Um, this was a definitely interesting panel and I'm very happy to conclude it now and um, hand the floor and your time back to you all and hope to talk to some of you in four to five minutes. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>